were persuaded, at least by this legend, that it was Einstein's greatest blunder not to touch the cosmological constant again, that it was such a bad idea, it was sort of a theoretical poison ivy and kind of a not a good thing to, to put your hands on. Because after all, if somebody was going to make a case for the cosmological constant, they'd have to be saying, in effect, they're smarter than Einstein, which, you know, may, may be true, but it's not likely to be true. Well, when you're a genius, the biggest blunder of your life may actually be, you know, something quite useful to the rest of us. And it looks like the universe does have something like a cosmological constant, and it's what's causing the universe to accelerate. Despite the prestige of Einstein, or perhaps because of it, the idea of a cosmological repulsive force might have failed to catch on among astronomers. But new observations were about to add persuasive evidence that turned the balance. To gather this evidence, one team of scientists had to travel, quite literally, to the ends of the Earth. In the very beginning, the universe was so dense that matter and energy were unable to take the forms we know them by today. They were bound up together in some mysterious higher state we can't duplicate in the laboratory. When the universe had been expanding for about 300,000 years though, the density dropped enough that matter and energy could go their separate ways. There was a sudden flash of light brighter than the surface of the sun, and that light is still out there, pervading every corner of the universe. But the universe has expanded enormously since then, so that radiation has been stretched out, redshifted, and diluted. To see it all today, we have to look in the microwave part of the spectrum. And even then, you need to use a highly sensitive receiver. The first people to do this were Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson back in 1965. They started out looking for the source of microwave noise in the telephone system and got more than they bargained for. In 1978, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery. The cosmic microwave background radiation is considered the single most compelling piece of evidence for the Big Bang. For most of the 20th century, that's all it was. The afterglow of the flash at the beginning of time. At first glance, the microwave background seems to be a truly featureless glow, completely smooth and uniform in all directions. But scientific theory predicted that if we looked hard enough, we'd see a faint pattern of brighter and darker patches where the glow was hotter or colder by a few millionth of a degree. If we could detect that pattern and measure its size, the theory said, we could learn the geometry of space. This in turn could tell us the amount of matter and energy in space and ultimately the fate of the universe. In the late 20th century, many teams tried to tease this faint signal out of the microwave noise. But it was a difficult measurement. More than 20 years passed before anyone succeeded. And only with the COBE experiment uh, of, that uh, launched in 1989, a, a magnificent NASA mission, uh, were scientists able to finally measure ripples in the microwave background radiation. This was a magnificent discovery that uh, electrified the community when it was first announced in 1990. And then uh, more experiments were developed in the decade of the 90s, and two of the most successful missions were flown uh, just a few years ago, the Maxima and Boomerang experiments, both of which detected the ripples on the scale of approximately one degree in the sky. Uh, there's no question that they have seen ripples in the sky as predicted by the theorists, which has enormous implications for our ideas of structure in the universe. So, just how do you measure ripples in the cosmic backdrop? One group, whose experiment was called Boomerang, decided the best approach was to go to Antarctica to fly a balloon. This wasn't as crazy an idea as it may sound. They hung a radio telescope from a balloon and it circled the uh, South Pole. 
And so it had two attributes. One is it had the new generation of detectors far, far more sensitive than anything in the past. The other big advance was the move to Antarctica. The microwave telescope was sensitive to frequencies that are absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere. It's so cold in Antarctica that the air can hold very little moisture, and the balloon lifted the instrument above most of that. To obtain the highest possible accuracy, the microwave detectors needed to take a long exposure while the balloon stayed at a constant altitude. This is where the Antarctic location really paid off. Normally, balloons rise in the daytime as they warm up and fall again in the evening when they cool off. But in the land of the midnight sun, air temperatures can be stable for days on end. So, the boomerang team was able to take a picture of the microwave sky with an exposure lasting a full 10 days. This was more than 20 times longer than anyone else had achieved. The result was accuracy better than one part in a million. And it led to this amazing result that you can just see in the picture that the warm spots are separated from each other by on the average of about a degree. And it's a very simple theoretical approach says that the, the mean distance between these big warm patches tells you the curvature of the universe. The important thing about this picture from the boomerang experiment is not the particular pattern of blobs and squiggles. It's the size of the pattern. Current cosmological theories predict the spacing between the brighter blobs in this picture. But the theory also says that the pattern might look much larger or smaller if space is curved. What do we mean by the curvature of space? Think of two parallel lines. We learn in school that parallel lines will never meet. But strictly speaking, that's true only if space is flat. If space has a bit of what's called positive curvature, those parallel lines will eventually meet up. In a universe with negative curvature, two lines would grow farther apart. Either way, the curvature of space has a huge effect on our view of objects in the far distance. It acts like a distorting lens between us and the cosmic background. And yet there seems to be no distortion in the background radiation. Those microwave ripples appear to be exactly the predicted size. That tells us that space is not curved. We live in a flat universe. Parallel lines will remain forever parallel. But there's a problem. The thing that determines the flatness or curvature of space is the amount of energy and matter it contains. Our theories tell us how much stuff there has to be in every cubic light year for space to be as flat as we observe. That's where the trouble comes in. No matter how hard they look, scientists have been unable to find more than one-third of that amount. And that's if they include the mysterious dark matter that we know is out there, but just can't see for some reason. There simply doesn't seem to be nearly enough matter in the universe to make space flat. Now, when we did this sort of work, trying to measure the density of the universe, taking all the galaxies and adding them all up and multiplying by the amount of dark matter, and basically taking a census 